All right, so we are at two o'clock. Uh, welcome everyone to the Together We Heal Interfaith Perspectives on Loving Our Neighbors, hosted by the Parliament of the World's Religions. Um, I'd like to extend an invitation to my colleague, Stephen, to begin the program. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Stephen Avino. I am the COO of the Parliament. Um, you may not know this, but the city of Chicago holds the distinction of serving as the birthplace of the modern interfaith movement. And it serves as the only city in the world to host two historic Parliament of the World's Religions convenings. In 1893, the World's Parliament of Religions was hosted as part of the World's Columbian Exposition, becoming the first organized interfaith gathering in modern history. In 1993, the Parliament returned to Chicago in celebration of the centenary of the 1893 convening. And since then, the organization by the same name has called Chicago home. The Parliament was created to cultivate harmony among the world's religions and to foster engagement with its guiding institutions in order to achieve a just, peaceful, and sustainable world. To accomplish this, we invite individuals like you. Um, the Parliament is joining organizers and community leaders in Chicago uh, this year as part of the city's Together We Heal initiative. The initiative aims to build racial healing across Chicago and promote civic unity by encouraging Chicagoans to connect across lines of difference and support a collective conversation about our truth and our promise as a city. This spring, the Parliament will host a series of virtual programs to foster conversation and share tools on healing and justice from the Chicago interfaith community. As part of our virtual observance of UN World Interfaith Harmony Week, the first webinar in this series will focus on highlighting the critical need for our faith communities to foster healing and love for our neighbors. Featuring faith leaders from around the city answering the question, how do we as communities and individuals heal and build better together? Miriam, do you want to talk a little bit about World Interfaith Harmony Week? Thank you, Stephen. Um, my name is Miriam Quesada, and I am a communication and program manager with the Parliament of the World's Religions. This program, as Stephen shared, is hosted in observance of UN World Interfaith Harmony Week, which is an annual interfaith observance based on a United Nations General Assembly resolution proposed in 2015. 2010 by His Majesty King Abdullah II and His Royal Highness Prince Ghazi Muhammad of Jordan. World Interview Harmony Week encourages grassroots events that link people together in global wave of understanding, respect, and action. And the parliament actually has a long uh, history with World Interview Harmony Week. We've been supporters of the okay, initiative. And we've, we've organized programs um, since 2011. Um, and in 2018, we were lucky enough to receive an opportunity from the John Templeton Foundation through a grant to promote World Interfaith Harmony Week to our network and encourage uh, the participation of organizers in the His Majesty King Abdullah II's World Interfaith Harmony Week Prize. Hosting an event like the one that you're participating in is part of the worldwide celebration, but the initiative also invites year-long engagement through letters of support, uh, videos of support from organizers like you, and um, sponsored proclamations of city governments that can be organized at the local network. Um, if you wanna learn more about this initiative and the work of the parliament on World Interfaith Harmony Week, you can email us at info at parliamentofreligions.org um, and I'll share additional contact information in the chat. Uh, I will be moderating the chat during the, today's program. So I encourage you to introduce yourselves, share us where you're from and where you're joining us um, and share any questions that you might have for our presenters. Stephen, back to you. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, so I'd like to take a, a moment to introduce our panelists today. First, we have Janan Hashim. She is a co-founder and civil rights attorney with Amal Law Group, the nation's first law firm founded by six Muslim women. Janan has practiced law since 2006 and is also an adjunct professor at McCormick Theological Seminary, where she team teaches religious pluralism and ministry. We also have Father John Polakowski, who is a survey uh, Friar Priest, Professor Emeritus as, of Social Ethics, and former Director of the Catholic Jewish Studies Program, which is part of the Bernadine Center for Theology and Ministry at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. He is also a trustee of the Parliament. Rabbi Michael Belinsky is a trustee of the Parliament as well and served as the Executive Vice President of the Chicago Board of Rabbis, an organization representing 200 rabbis of all denominations. He is a member of the Jewish Catholic Scholars Dialogue in Chicago and serves as a member of the Council of Religious Leaders of Metropolitan Chicago. Sharon Kaur Singh is a business consultant and a program manager. Currently, she works at the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund, a national Sikh organization based in Washington, DC. Sharon organizes and develops programs to help 
to educate, inspire, and empower the Sikh community. We also have Sidas Segovia Taylor, and she is the founder, executive director for Organic Oneness, and has 25 years of nonprofit experience working with Black and Latino youth and families in Chicago. She prides herself on being a social justice advocate by promoting racial and environmental justice, physical and spiritual health, and the oneness of humankind and religion. Segovia Taylor also serves as a member of the local spiritual assembly, assembly of the Baha'is of Chicago. So how this is gonna work, I'm gonna ask a question and um, we, you know, we'll, uh, whoever wants to go first, uh, let me know. But uh, so can you share a brief reflection on your faith's perspective of caring and loving our neighbors? How does your faith perspective expand the definition of our neighbors across boundaries? Janan, do you, why don't we start with you? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, uh, Marion, for pulling this together, and of course, to the Parliament of the World's Religions for uh, hosting this and, and having a really good discussion. Um, to answer the first question, you know, it all goes back as a Muslim to the Quran, our holy book, and the example of the Prophet, which is called Sunnah of the Prophet, and his sayings, which are called Hadith. Um, I'll quote from the Quran uh, when it comes down to um, how Islam looks at caring and loving for our neighbors. And I have right here, it says, uh, this is the fourth chapter, 36 line, so, uh, where God says, serve God and join no partners with him and do good to parents, kinsfolk, orphans, those in need, neighbors who are near, neighbors who are strangers, and the companion by your side, the wayfarer you meet, and what your right hands possess. For God loves not the arrogant and the vain glorious. So when I look at this, what I'm seeing is there's no distinction in terms of faith, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, nationality, or any of those you know, pigeonholes that one could be placed in. God is telling Muslims to be, to do good to this broad group of people, starting initially with the parents, to your family, and then broader than that. Um, and then there are a number, when you look at the neighbors, you have those who you know, and those who are strangers. In Islam, neighbors have rights over us, and there are things that we cannot do to our neighbors. And this comes from the practice of Prophet Muhammad and his sayings. Uh, for instance, we have to help them. We have to treat them kindly, not cause harm, share our food. And there's a list of about 11 or so things. And some of the things that we're forbidden from doing is, this is interesting, not exchanging greetings. So we are supposed to exchange greetings with our, our neighbors when it's easy in today's day and age to just kind of like walk past them with the head down as if you're thinking about something. We're not allowed to gossip about our neighbors. We're not allowed to hate them, hurt them, uh, let them go hungry. And again, this is for those neighbors that we know and those who are the strangers. And then lastly, I'll bring up the last um, sermon of the prophet because in it, he shared with his immediate followers and is to go down amongst the generations what was on his mind and his uh, parting thoughts. And th uh, this phrase shares with us how um, racial and ethnic prejudice was on the prophet's minds, mind and how he did not want that prejudice to develop into discrimination. Where the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he said, oh people, remember that your Lord is one. All mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superior superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over a black, nor does a black have any superiority over a white, except by piety and good action. Indeed, the noblest among you is the one with the best character. So that I think sets the foundation of how we're supposed to look at our neighbors, how we're to treat them that it's not a narrow group, it's a broad group. Um, so that's my short answer for what could essentially be a very, very long paper. Thank you, Janan. Uh, Michael, do you want to dive in on this? Sure. Um, there's probably going to be some repetition, and, and not surprised we should find ultimately uh, some common ethical and um, moral uh, imperatives among us. Um, but within a specific Jewish context, and specifically within a context 
of the Hebrew Bible and the book of Leviticus, um, loving your neighbor is part of and related to an additional verse, two verses, which I'll just read. Um, this is from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 and 18. Um, Don't hate your kinsfolk in your heart. Reprove your kinsfolk, your kinsmen, but incur no guilt because of him and be him, her, whatever, however one wants to fill that uh, term in today uh, morally. Um, do not take vengeance or bear a grudge against uh, your, your fellow, your people, but, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am God. Um, now, in each of these two verses, and, and there's parallels between them, in the first verse, you have a prohibition. Don't hate your uh, fellow in your heart. Um, to sort of resolve that prohibition, what should you do? Reprove them. In other words, tell them what is bothering you. Tell them um, what you see them perhaps doing wrong. And, but at the same time, do not bear sin because of them, uh, in, which can be read in a couple of ways. One is, if you see someone doing something wrong and you are silent, then you become accountable as well, obviously within certain parameters. And or secondly, it's also read not in contradiction to it, uh, but I think in complementing uh, it. Um, in the process of reproving someone, do not bear sin because of them that your attempt to reprove, to reprove them causes you to sin. In other words, the act of challenging someone, you do it in a sinful way um, and in a way which is not there to achieve results in a way that could be haughty or whatever um, way one, one can think about that. Um, and, and the second verse also begins with a prohibition. Don't take vengeance or bear a grudge against anyone, perhaps for something they had done to you. Um, what you should do to resolve it is the hafta l'reicha kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. And the final justification for it is, uh, I am God, um, which one can read certainly in a way of recognizing that we ultimately are all, and uh, ultimately all stand um, before God. Um, now, to be honest, within the context of Leviticus, this is probably talking about internal to the ancient Israelite community. Um, when it's talking about uh, neighbor, it's talking about your people, etc. However, it comes certainly legitimate, uh, and many people have within the Jewish tradition to extrapolate that, certainly that one could then apply it to broader society. Now, if we do want to apply that for broader to society, which I have absolutely, which I would agree with, certainly in this case, and that is to point out that part of the dynamic in this context of loving your neighbor is knowing how to challenge your neighbor, knowing how to offer reproof, knowing how to speak up, and that the relationship is a relationship which involves ideally love, which is more than just an intellectual, emotional feeling, but an expression of support and benefiting. Um, I think as Janan has, has, has absolutely correctly described, um, but it, 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 it is part of a relationship of also of encountering another in which one has to he, both be willing to reprove the other if you feel there are issues, as well as to be able to listen to reproof. When you become challenged or your community becomes challenged because there, there are issues. Now that's very hard to do. And, and again, it's the biblical sense don't do it in a way that creates sin, all right? On, on one hand, stand up and have your voice be heard, but do it in a way in which your voice is going to be heard. And, and that's certainly a, a, a huge and difficult challenge. Um, but I think part of, the, part of ultimately the dynamic of it and how particularly how both individuals and I think communities can learn to relate to each other. Secondly, I would just add that um, there's a rabbinic debate from about 2,000 years ago as <clears throat> which is the greatest principle, if one can reduce uh, many biblical laws to one single principle, but which is the greatest 
uh, principle, and we have this certainly common to religious traditions. Rabbi Akiva says it's love your neighbor as yourself. Um, ben Azai, a contemporary sage of Rabbi Akiva from about 2000 years ago, disagrees and says, Akiva, I have a principle greater than you. And there he quotes back to Genesis that all human beings are created in the image of God. Um, and, and, and they're not in major opposition to each other. Um, but perhaps Ben Azai understands that the conception of neighbor means that you have to create the conception of relationship. Um, and that may be certainly an ideal, but on a bottom line level, um, you are accountable and others have uh, accountability to you and, but also basic fundamental rights and dignity that they deserve because everyone is a creation created in the image of God that is independent of one's community. Um, that is what the definition certainly biblically, and again, we share it, but biblically to be human. Um, and therefore Ben Azai is perhaps saying, even if you're not in relationship, everyone deserves um, a certain uh, uh, a dignity. Everyone deserves, uh, has ultimate worth. Everyone deserves to be treated properly because everyone is created the image of God. All right, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'd like to ask Sharon, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you so much, Stephen and Miriam, um, for inviting me to be on this panel. And um, I represent the Sikh faith today. Um, and as Sikhs, our perspective of caring and loving our neighbors stems from the teachings of our 10 gurus, the founders of the Sikh religion. Our gurus stood for the equality and denounced any forms of discrimination uh, pertaining to gender, race, caste, creed, religion, or color. Our commitment as Sikhs to religious acceptance and pluralism is very strong. And in fact, our ninth guru himself, Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji, and many other Sikhs gave their lives to protect the rights of others to practice their, their faith freely. So in our religious scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib, it says that one God created all humans. All humans are molded from the same clay and that we need to recognize the Lord's light within all of us and not consider social class or status as there are no classes or castes in the world hereafter. So all these teachings guide us as Sikhs in terms of appreciating how our neighbors are and loving our neighbors and to expand the definition of how we cross boundaries. We do this by celebrating the rich traditions and the histories of those who are different from us. We cultivate the commonalities that bring us together. And because we deeply believe in the importance of justice and equality, we practice social contribution and community service. During times when we face a pandemic like the one we are facing today, uh, we utilize our free community kitchens that are housed in our gurdwaras to feed uh, many of those who are in need. We have a concept called Langar or free kitchen, which is uh, one where all Sikh Americans can reach out as volunteers and feed people from all walks of life. In terms of social justice, uh, we are thought to stand in solidarity with our neighbors or any other marginalized community, especially those who are impacted by systematic, systematic uh, problems like Islamophobia, racism, xenophobia. Unfortunately, we ourselves are often frequent targets of hate, uh, and this has compelled us to further stand up to do our part, to build bridges and play a role in, pre in the preservation and procurement of civil rights for all of us here in America. So I'll stop there, but I'll look to uh, continue discussing this with the other questions in terms of how we play a role. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I'd like to ask John if he has any thoughts on this. Well, thank you. And I'm very happy to join this important conversation. Um, I'm glad I followed my colleague and friend, uh, Rabbi Polinsky, because he laid out the um, Hebrew Bible and Jewish traditions on um, these questions. Uh, there's been a profound change as, since Vatican II, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council within Catholicism on the, uh, our understanding of the Hebrew scriptures. At one time, we tended to see them as something where 
that were just a prelude to a full-fledged notion of religion that you could only discover in and through um, Christianity. Um, in our somewhat better moments, we saw them as a bit of a, a prelude, a, a setting of the ground for what eventually became uh, Catholic teaching. The Second Vatican Council, uh, which brought back the Bible to a more central place in uh, Catholicism than it had been for some time. Uh, it used to be said in Catholicism that Catholics bought very expensive Bibles to put on their coffee table, but they never opened them. Um, and to the extent that was true, there was a fear of uh, reading the Bible on your own without notes and so on. But some of that has changed and changed almost dramatically in, in Catholicism in light of Vatican II. And so the teachings of the Hebrew scriptures, which Rabbi Belinsky laid out, are now really teachings at the heart of Christianity as well. They are not just a foil or a prelude for subsequent Christian teaching. They stand as part of the very heart of Christianity. Um, Pope John Paul II, uh, in one of his speeches in Mainz, Germany, said that when you look at the heart of Christianity, there you find Judaism. So that would be our first basis. Uh, if we want to follow the teachings of Jesus on this, we have to understand how positively he appropriated the Hebrew Bible. And, and for him, there was no Old Testament. There was just the scriptures. When we turn to the teachings of Jesus himself, of course, we see not only word, but action. Uh, we hear his proclamation in uh, the Beatitudes. Uh, we see his uh, praise of the Good Samaritan, um, but we also see Jesus acknowledging the uh, basic humanity uh, of showing great respect to people whom many at that time considered outsiders and inferior. Um, the the so-called uh, country people uh, were not quite sure who they were, but the uh, the people who seemed on the margins of society at that time, uh, maybe living in what would be called the hinterlands and so on. Um, he praised the, the Samaritans um, uh, who were rejected by many, if not most of their, their uh, neighbors at that time because they believed differently. Now, in addition to the re-emphasis on the Bible, the centrality, of Jesus' social preaching. Um, the Second Vatican Council also uh, issued an important document um, on the um, on religious freedom, the Declaration on Religious Freedom. That was a marked change, a profound change, for one of the most profound changes to occur in Catholic teaching uh, in the Second Vatican Council. Because for many years, going back to particularly 1870 and the syllabus of errors of Pope Pius IX, uh, where the Pope uh, uh, denounced uh, the notion, any notion of religious pluralism and freedom of conscience as a satanic idea. But the Second Vatican Council in this declaration said that religious freedom is a freedom that all people have as a result of their birthright. Uh, human dignity is something you're born with, not something you acquire by right belief and so on. Um, the notion that only Catholics have the correct belief um, and really resulted in a kind of um, turning other people into second-class citizens and on many occasions throughout history even into the 20th century, denying people of other faith traditions full human rights and, and full human dignity. And that has changed. Uh, finally, I would say uh, Pope John Paul II uh, has added to what the Second Vatican Council said um, in many of his speeches, where he denounced racism and anti-Semitism as sins. Now, 
That may be a simple statement in some way, but in the Catholic moral tradition, to call something a sin is the um, probably the strongest denunciation you can make of it, uh, of these realities. So racism is clearly uh, a sinful uh, act uh, on the part of a Catholic person. This was reinforced in a, um, a really wonderful uh, document produced by the late Cardinal George of Chicago, which unfortunately never has gotten the attention it deserves, even within uh, the, the Archdiocese of Chicago. Uh, and I, I would suggest that this time of um, social upheaval and social transition, it will be very important, particularly for Catholics, to go back and look at that document anew, because it could be a, a real building block for racial harmony and understanding uh, within uh, this metropolitan area. Uh, let me just um, add one more point. And that is, I think it's important that we not only look at documents or even look at sacred texts. We have to find ways of concretely implementing uh, the vision of those texts in the living out of life in the city of Chicago on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we need to look at ways in which we can really uh, begin some conversations across faith lines in our neighborhoods and so on. Chicago is often called the city of neighborhoods. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if there could be organized um, Relig interreligious account encounters on a neighborhood level until we meet people of other traditions and not only read about them uh, or even read their sacred books. I think we won't understand who they are and we won't see the opportunities that do exist for meaningful collaboration uh, and new understandings, uh, and under new understandings and a meaningful collaboration that can uh, really generate the kind of social cohesion and social solidarity that are essential if Chicago or any major metropolitan area will be prosperous in the good sense, not just economically, but for the quality of life that exists within that city. Thanks, John. Uh, so we are, you know, we're, we're a little short on time, but I think we have a few more questions left. Um, Saida, I'd like to hear from you on, on our first question. Thank you, and I'll, I'll try and keep everything brief. I know that we have such a short time together. Um, but in terms of looking at the neighbor, I do want to give some context of what the Baha'i faith is and believes. Um, I know this is new to a lot of people, uh, and what we believe is the oneness of humanity, the oneness of religion, uh, and we believe that God is God. And as the world progressed, there were different messengers and prophets that helped us understand God. Uh, and so the, the, the beliefs of the Baha'i system is that we're all unified. We all belong to an organic unit. And one, when one part of the organism suffers, the rest of the body feels, it, it feels its consequences. And so some of our guiding principles are race unity, gender equality, harmony between science and religion, universal education, spiritual solutions to economic problems. Uh, and here in America, we are charged as Baha'is to really understand the, the societal and spiritual illness of racism. And so Baha'is are charged to think about this at, at every level, uh, the individual level, the community level and institutional level. Now, Baha'u'llah has given us so many scriptures on how to do that. Uh, so at the individual level, he says, my first counsel is this, to possess a pure and kindly radiant heart that thine may be a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. So we have to have a pure heart, first and foremost. The second thing he said was, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aids thou shalt see with thine own eyes and not through the eyes of thy neighbor, and shalt know of thine own knowledge 
and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. So we need to hold ourselves accountable and understand what the truth is. You know, Baha'u'llah says that the, the fundamentals, the, that, that the foundation of all human virtues is truthfulness. And if we're not looking at the truth, then we can't move on. And so that's very applicable to this day and age. What is the truth of our history? What is the truth of religion? What is the truth? So there are all these things that Baha'u'llah talks about. And then in terms of our neighbor or our brother, we're all familiar with the golden rule. I think that stems through each religion and just you know talks about it a little bit differently. But Baha'u'llah says, blessed is he who prefereth his brother before himself. So it's not even, he takes it to a whole other level of like, you know, let, let's treat people of how we want to be treated. But now we have to treat people better than how we want to be treated ourselves. And he goes on to say, and if thine eyes be turned towards justice, choose thou for thy neighbor that which thou choosest for thyself. And so we should always be thinking, how can I make life better? for those that are around me? How can I bring truth to light? How can I be a just person and carry that out on a daily basis from my own accountability as a spiritual being to God? Um, and in terms of uh, racism and everything that's going on right now in society, uh, the Baha'i faith says that the fundamental solution to racial and ethnic conflict rests ultimately on the common recognition of the oneness of humankind. And so we have to recognize again that we're one organism that is interconnected and we can't separate that. And, and what's happened is that people have categorized themselves in superiority to others. And that's what we have to kind of diminish and, and figure out is how do we all see each other in the, si in the sight of God, of how God sees us, which is noble noble have I, have I created thee, um, and, 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 and bring justice to light. Thank you, Sada. All of everyone's answers was incredible. I learned new things from each and everyone's answer today, and just for that question alone. We have a, a couple more questions to go through um, uh, in, uh, let's see, how many more minutes left to half hour? Um, maybe less, a little bit less. So uh, the second question is, has your faith community faced racial issues and how has the greater Chicago community and leadership responded to these issues? With room for improvement, what would you like to see your community do better? So let's start again with Janan. Sure. Um, so we're looking at the contemporary time. The, here in the United States, the largest racial group within the Muslim community is the black community. And the second largest is people of color. You know? And then you have a small group that would be classified as, as white. Um, in terms of Chicago, uh, the Chicago community and leadership response, when there are racial issues that happen, as so implied in my answers, yes, there are racial issues that, that happen within the community. Um, when, when, you're, when you're asking, Steve, are you asking about um, intra or outside of the the community i would say intra but it, it could be either or okay so within the community i would say yeah i mean there is there, there always has been racial issues um as i stated in, in the first answer you know, it, it was a concern of prophet muhammad peace and blessings be upon him because he saw that it was a reality um, and uh, one of the um most frequently cited um verses in the quran in the interfaith community about, you know, God created you as nations and tribes so you can know one another came because of a racial uh, slur that was made uh, within the within the area of the Prophet Muhammad and he said, who said this? And a man stood up and said, it was me. It's like, well, tell me what you see around you in terms of people's skin color. It's like, well, I see white, I see brown, I see black, I see red. And the Prophet said to him, uh, essentially he said, uh, you're no better than any of, of any, uh, no one is better than any other except uh, through their piety. And then the verse came down con memorializing that uh, in, in, in the Quran, that concept. So right from the beginning until now, yeah, there, there are problems of um, racial uh, issues within the, the Muslim community. Um, 
what's being done about it. I think, I think because of what has happened, what had happened over 2020, um, not just COVID-19, but combine that with the social unrest, the, the mosques are taking an internal look, say, okay, what's going on and how can we make this better? And so the mosque leadership is, is taking action. When it comes down to racial issues from outside toward those within the Muslim community, I would say that the Chicago community leadership has responded fairly well and they're, they're trying. It's hard to move several million people in a certain direction. Um, I'll share with you a quick anecdote. In 2020, Rabbi Belinsky and, and Father um, Polakowski, you guys might remember this. There was this uh, um, pastor down in, in Florida who wanted to called on his congregation of about 30 people uh, for Quran burning day and it became this huge sensation and I was overseas at the time I came back I was involved with the Council of Islamic um, Organizations of Greater Chicago at that time they said Janan we're going to be putting together a press release because this Quran burning day was going to be so occur on one of our holidays so I said okay fine and at that point, the night before the press conference, uh, we had like, I don't know, 15 people who were going to speak individually for about a minute or two. And then by the time I was walking into the press conference, I kept getting more and more names. By the end, I think it was like 24 people from different faith traditions across Chicago wanting to participate in this press conference and to get each one of them to speak for like 30 seconds. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it was very long. It had great coverage. And and I will never forget one of the um, uh, networks had broadcasted on the news a four minute clip, which in broadcast terms is a very long period of time of just about every one of those faith traditions making a nice little clip of how this guy down in uh, Florida had not just has it wrong, but how that doesn't represent America, it doesn't represent Chicago, and it's not going to be tolerated here. And I'll never forget Reverend Livingston just looking straight at the camera saying, brother, you've got it wrong. I was like, dang, that's great. And it wasn't us saying it as Muslims. This, these were our neighbors coming to help us just as we would come to help them and how we have come to help them. And this, Stephen, it didn't come out of a vacuum. This came out of years of interfaith dialogue, uh, interfaith interaction, where as Father uh, Polakowski has said, we need to come together. If the neighbor, neighborhoods can come together and interact, we'll understand each other better, right? And so it didn't come out of a vacuum and those relationships have just become stronger and stronger and stronger. So I think it would be hard for something like Quran Burning Day to survive in, in Chicago in 2021, at least I would hope. Thank you, Janan. Uh, Michael, do you wanna chime in there on this? You're, you're muted, Michael. Uh, first, I'm much better muted. Um, first, the, uh, just on main to what Janan said, and and um, and our communities have you know faced have had similar responses um, when things have come up. Um, uh, just on the uh, looking at it from uh, through a certain point of view of racism and racial lens within the Jewish community. Um, the Jewish community has become more aware of its um, racial diversity, which there isn't really, it, it's it not really a category per se that has anything to do with Judaism, but it's just that uh, Jews come in all shapes and sizes and um, I'll say all colors. Um, and there's been a greater development, particularly in the African-American Jewish community um, in, in recent years. And people have worked for better integration um, within uh, the Jewish community uh, uh, with now with that community. Now there is a specific congregation um, that uh, tends to be mostly African-American. Um, well, you still will find some African-Americans at different um, uh, synagogues as well. Uh, but the important thing is, you know, the rabbi of that congregation is, is a member of the board of rabbis. Um, and so there's been greater, it's, it's still stuff the Jewish community has to work through, um, but certainly, uh, ideally, there shouldn't be issues, and certainly the community um, has has worked on it and continues and continues to work on it. I mean, the deeper I think racial issues and challenges are, you know, found with and certainly if we're talking about Chicago, certainly within the Chicago community, um, we know we know they're there. We uh, and. The challenge becomes, as I tr really tried to say earlier, is 
how can we really hear and listen to each other um, in a way that goes beyond saying, yes, we have to love each other, which everyone agrees. And yes, we have to treat each other properly, but there, uh, there are grievances. Um, there are tensions, uh, certainly from the issues uh, with this past summer um, and communities were talking past each other, criticizing each other, instead of really being able to listen to each other. So um, that's what I suggest, part of loving your neighbor is being able to hear their critique of you and be able to challenge that critique back. Um, can we question each other in a way in which people do not view that questioning? And do we offer those questions in a spirit in which we ask them as questions, not to delegitimate positions, but that to really gain more information and understanding um, and, to, and to be able to genuinely hear um, the other community uh, when um, they are, when they're in pain. I, I guess, uh, and I think someone else said this as well, but part of loving your neighbor is knowing your, when your neighbor is in pain uh, and being able to get a grasp on that pain um, and to do that again in a way in which people not a one-way relationship, but really in a two-way relationship. And I think through that begins to help, you know, with healing. Thank you, Michael. Sharon, would you like to weigh in on this? Sure, thank you, yeah. Um, so like many of the other communities who have spoken here, um, the Sikh community too has been unfortunately targets of discrimination, especially due to the unique and visible identity that we have, which is the turban. The turban um, is most often worn by Sikh men in the Sikh faith, but in some instances, women also do wear the turban. Here in Chicago, there have been many instances where especially Sikh students are bullied in schools due to the fact either whether they wear the turban or a head covering or have long hair. As a CELDEF employee in an organization that deals with a lot of Sikh related matters on the nationwide as, as a nation, national organization, uh, we often get calls about a lot of hate incidences, unfortunately, including one recently here in Chicago, uh, where a sick girl was targeted in her classroom, where someone outside of a school was given a Zoom link uh, to dial into her classroom and threaten her family and herself. Um, so these types of incidences, unfortunately, are only getting too common. Even racial profiling is an issue that faces the Sikh community. For example, uh, one that's personal to me is my husband experienced a situation where he was stopped by our own Elmhurst police because he was riding his bike along the railroad tracks and someone uh, called into the police to say he was a suspicious character. And the police then stopped him, had to check his ID and make sure that he was not a threat to our community. Um, so Chicago Sikhs have definitely been victims. and not only of bullying and racial profiling, but also of hate speech and hate crimes. A few years ago, what was supposed to be a quick trip to the grocery store ended in a brutal attack of Mr. Indujit Singh Makar, a Sikh a member of our community. He was driving down the road when he encountered another driver yelling uh, racial slurs, including bin Laden, terrorists, go back to your country. To avoid confronting this driver, Mr. Mucker pulled over to let this driver pass him, but instead the driver stopped in front of him, came out, began repeatedly punching him in the face uh, through the open car window until Mr. Mucker lost consciousness. Thankfully, he survived and was treated for his injuries. However, these sort of incidences have taught the Sikh community all around the country, not just Chicago, to be very vigilant um, because we are often targets of hate as far as um, how our community and others responded, we had an outpouring of love from many interfaith communities and other people in our neighborhoods, especially, I would say the Islamic Center of Naperville that pulled together all community groups for a solidarity event at their mosque to support Mr. Mucker and his family, and also the Sikh community at large. This event was so heartwarming that it helped, I think our community and especially Mr. Mucker and his family heal from this horrific incident. So I would say as far as, you know, hate incidences spiking across our nation today, especially with COVID related hate incidences as well, I believe it is our duty as Sikhs and to not only continue our practices of social contribution and community service work, but continue to build coalitions with other faith-based community members uh, to reduce this type of rate 
and hate incidences. Uh, we should also be calling, I guess, our state and local and national leaders to condemn this type of hate to ensure all targeted communities have the resources necessary to combat and right this, this continuing rise in hate uh, that unfortunately we are seeing in our nation today. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, John, do, uh, do you have anything to say on this topic? I, I do, uh, briefly. Um, for, I, I would say, first of all, we need to remember that Catholics at one time were targets in this country. The Ku Klux Klan had Catholics, Jews, and African Americans on their list of those who are, should be hated. Uh, we have been removed by the Ku Klux Klan from that uh, list. I'm not sure that says anything positive, but uh, anyway, uh, so Catholics right now are not uh, discriminated against in the way they once were. Uh, having said that, I think uh, within the Catholic community historically, the treatment of African-Americans in particular, people of color um, at, uh, in the last century uh, with the creation of separate churches and the prejudice that didn't allow uh, uh, people of um, African-American ancestry to enter the Catholic priesthood, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a real history of discrimination uh, and marginalization of uh, uh, African-American Catholics in this country, which is little known by the dominant uh, white Catholic community, and that needs to be addressed. Um, Secondly, I, I, think, um, I, I think that in the light of what happened this summer with uh, the, killing of, um, the killing in Minneapolis and the, uh, uh, the demonstrations and the Black Lives Matter, um, the, I would say, white religious community, including the Catholic community, has not mounted a sufficient response. And I think that's true in this city. There were promises made by religious leaders to really confront structural racism and to develop programming that would be um, instituted throughout um, the churches uh, of their, uh, under their responsibility. But I don't see that happening. Uh, uh, I had proposed that this Lent, which we have, we're in, into now in the Catholic community, be a time when uh, the traditional practice of um, uh, educational programming in the evenings um, uh, is very commonplace. Um, that those be include, maybe even be entirely focused on how we can confront racism and to help the congregation um, really understand the basis of uh, structural racism rooted in slavery and so on. Uh, I think also, and this is my final point, I think there is a, at times an insufficient linkage in um, African-American, predominantly African-American neighborhoods in this city between um, cat longstanding Catholic parishes, which at one time were ethnic and local uh, African-American churches, including those that are sort of independent, but are the ones that really are in touch with the a grassroots population in many cases in the way that the Catholic churches remain kind of white enclaves in the midst of a African-American community. And I, I think that needs to be addressed. Uh, finally, I think we need to take the old uh, and frequently quoted Jewish story about uh, uh, the two men who were friends and speaking to each other and uh, one, uh, says, do you love me? Uh, and kept repeating that. And the other one said, well, why are you asking this so much? Because he said, if you really truly love me, you know, you know what hurts me. And we need to find out what uh, hurts our neighbors if we are to begin the process of reconciliation. Thank you, John. Um, due to time, we'll probably not get to the last two questions that we had planned, but I take, we'll take a question from the audience. But before that, I'd like to hear from Saida on, on, on our, our question that we've been discussing. Saida? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. So um, 
The Baha'i faith, and again, to give some context, is the second largest widespread religion in the world next to Christianity. And so the diversity is incredible. You can go to anywhere in the world and find uh, Baha'is. Uh, now, in terms of Chicago, uh, we, we are plagued with the same um, thing that everyone is plagued with, the, the, the separate neighborhoods, you know, um, everything that's going on. Um, but the writings have given us a clear roadmap of what we're supposed to be doing in terms of uh, holding ourselves accountable. Again, you know, that individual level, being uh, community oriented and working towards social action, being a part of public discourse. We have uh, devotionals that are going on all over the city, bringing neighbors together and praying together. Uh, we have children's activities, junior youth activities. So that at the community level is very outward facing. We're trying to work together with one another. Uh, and then at the institutional levels, we have you know, some members of the faith doing individual work, trying to figure out policies. Um, and the, the Baha'i writings, uh, again, going back to self, tells us what we should do. And just as an example, um, in, in the book of Advent of Divine Justice, uh, it says, let the white make a supreme effort in their resolve to contribute their share to the solution of this problem. To abandon once, for, once and for all their usually inherent at times subconscious sense of superiority to correct their tendencies towards revealing a patronizing attitude towards the members of the other race. And if you go deep into Advent of, of Divine Justice, you'll see you know, what role each person needs to play in bringing unity um, and eradicating racism. Um, and so those are just some of the things that, I mean, it, I could go on again forever, but I know that we're very pressed on time, um, but that's just to give you an, a, a small inkling of, um, you know, in the Baha'i community, what, what we're trying to do to rid ourselves from this intertwined fabric uh, that 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 we're all trying to get rid of, you know, the, the racism is like a stain in in our material. You know, you 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 really have to rub it ahead and and be intentional and figure it out uh, how how to get rid of it. Um, and and that's that's our charge as a Baha'i community. So we're hoping, you know, to be a part of these kind kind of conversations all the time so that we're learning from other people um, and, and, and understanding how to apply our own writings. Um, and that's only gonna come when we are having a dialogue across sectors, across religions, across you know um, every kind of diversity because together we'll bring a piece of the puzzle and say, oh, that's what we're supposed to be doing as a humanity, you know. So, so I, I again, I'm I'm very honored to be here um, and and to share just some of the perspectives of the Baha'i faith. Thank you, Saida. So, we did have a couple more questions, but uh, we only have uh, seven minutes left. So, I'd like to take questions from the audience. Uh, let me see which one. Uh, let's pick a random one. Uh, this one's from C Cynthia Leonard. She asks, I wonder if you could tell me how best to alter perception away from the historical misinterpretation of sacred texts. It seems to me we go a long way in, in writing injustice overall. Anybody want to tackle that question from our panelists? Well, yeah. I, I can speak from a somewhat Christian point of view. Um, I think we, though we want to honor and respect our sacred text, we also have to acknowledge that they were written in a social political context. And oftentimes the, um, what we might call racism or um, unfavorable views of other people have infiltrated into uh, those texts. Um, I myself, when I, uh, read the Psalms uh, often do have difficulties with some of the uh, violence that seems to be justified within them. Um, and some of the denunciation of pagans, uh, for example, without any uh, acknowledgement that there maybe have been um, 
uh, favorable um, parts of those traditions that we can even learn from. I certainly have learned from uh, people who identify as pagans within the parliament of the world's religions. So uh, I think we have to be conscious of the fact that um, uh, forms of um, hatred, hatred, social hatred can and have infiltrated even some of our most sacred documents. Yeah, I would just add to that. Um, the, the, the challenge is, I think, when it comes to sacred texts, that um, maybe violent sacred texts or in other examples that uh, Father John correctly described, um, and that is how does the interpretive community understand that text and what do they do with it? Does the current interpretive community of that tradition read that text as normative, as commanding? Um, how does it how does it balance it? How does it how does how does how does it play it out? Um, how does it in the context of the broader sacred text that a community has is a text that may be more of a violent negative text? Um, how is it then understood within? the broader the broader text um, and how do they speak to each other speak against each other and play themselves out so i think there's a lot of work to do there um, i think some of the work has been done i think um, certainly some of our religious traditions um, that i personally know have models of addressing precisely that question um, because i i fear that if we just historicize them then we put them in a certain historical period and then they're no longer um, necessarily relevant or, or can speak to us. Um, but is there a way that we have of internal to our own traditions redeeming sacred texts that still allow them to be sacred? Um, and I, I think there are ways to do this. It's complicated uh, and 30 seconds is not enough to describe a methodology, but I think there is a methodology in a way to do this that is possible within interpretive traditions. Because texts live within our tradition. They're not just a 3000 year old text. They're texts that speak to us now. Well, what do we do with that? How, how does our interpretive tradition serve a model for that? Sure, um, Saida, you had your hand up, I think first. Yes, uh, and just very quickly. Um, so so what, we, what we always have to do is look at and, and this is from a Baha'i perspective, uh, look at the sacred text with a diverse group of people to truly understand the truth and the heart of what the texts are saying um, so that we don't fall into the trap of having just one point of view of what the text is saying. Uh, and so through consultation, um, that's when people come together and read the scriptures out loud and then tell each other what we envision and what we understood from that sacred text. Uh, and so that that's one way to try and, you know, dispel some of the the personal interpretations of what it is um, and inflict it with some of our own biases. Uh, so and, and then another thing that we have to do is get to the the essence, the spiritual essence of what God is trying to tell us through these scriptures. You know, sometimes um, we take it uh, for granted, our, our privileges and, and what how we walk through the world uh, and we apply our own way of thinking to it. And so we always have to get to the spiritual, go back to the spiritual essence of what is being said. Um, and how does it benefit others? How is this sacred text in service to others uh, and not benefiting my own ego? Uh, so again, always holding uh, yourself accountable um, when, when, when reading the sacred text. Thank you, Sarah. Janan? I just want to chime in real quickly as a point of distinction with Islam and the Quran. Uh, when the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, it was immediately written down. Uh, as opposed to, um, for instance, the, the gospel, as I understand it. All right, so that's a point of distinction. So that the word that was written down, compiled into the book, as we know, as, uh, as the Quran, 
not one letter, not one word, not one sentence has been reordered, removed, or adjusted, or changed from that point until today. All right. Now, that being said, interpretation is a completely different thing. And every human being has their own interpretation of the verses that they're reading. And that is that goes to what uh, Rabbi Blinsky was saying. This is a very true point about interpretation and how verses are, are being interpreted. Um, so I just wanted to chime in there with that clarification as to Islam. Thank you, Janan. So I, I think we have a, uh, we are at, at three o'clock, but I'd like to go for a few more minutes. Um, Sharon, would you like to, to add to this conversation? Sure, yeah, um, for, for the Sikhs, the scripture that we have, which is called the Guru Granth Sahib was actually written by the gurus themselves. Um, so that is really um, similar to what uh, Janan was saying, you know, we don't have any changes that are made to the Guru Granth Sahib from the time it was written to the time we are now practicing it 500 years later and reading the scriptures. So there's really no uh, risk there in terms of how we interpret it because it's really pretty straightforward and it tells us exactly what we need to know about how to live our lives as Sikhs. Um, so that's a, one of the things that I do want to mention is you know, it is it is very authentic and we are not allowed to even change a single word similar to some of the others that have mentioned uh, for your faiths as well. So it has really helped us as a community move forward, uh, understanding the teachings really well, because there's no um, it's not really subjected to any type of debate. And it's authentic. Sure. Um, Sharon, you had messaged me. You wanted to answer this question uh, that, that was submitted to us by Isaac Cohen. Uh, would it be helpful to organize an interfaith prayer followed by discussing interfaith and racial issues once or twice a year, which should emphasize what unites all of us? Did you want to answer that question? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I looked at that and I said, you know what, the great thing is um, we in the Chicagoland community, thankfully, are already doing that. Uh, I've been part of some of uh, the events here, including the World Peace Prayer Day that was organized by the Naperville Interfaith Organization. So we have a lot of interfaith organizations all across Chicago that I think could be a, doing a better job of working with one another and, and organizing such events. Um, I know right now I'm also working on another initiative to plan a full day interfaith program for high schools uh, to be hosted at Benedictine University. Uh, with all different interfaith leaders to build bridges and with fellow high school students to hear from local faith leaders to do service work together. Um, so prayer, I think, has definitely been, you know, a very important thing in, in coming together as communities because it not only helps us uh, talk about the issues that are important, but pray together and learn from one another and also address these issues collectively. And we have a lot of opportunity to do that and we are doing it. And I think we should definitely do it more especially with the World Parliament as well, which I know y'all are doing a great job at it too. Um, so we can continue to work with you as well to continue this type of work in our communities. Thanks, Sharon. Michael? Yeah, I have uh, no interest in interfaith prayer. Um, I think from my vantage point, it doesn't do any credit, give any credibility to the a particular tradition's own understanding of prayer, but forces us to compromise to lowest common denominators. Um, one thing we did with the Council of Religious Leaders in Metropolitan Chicago is we did do prayers for peace at uh, Daily Plaza a couple of years in a row, but we did it where it was not interfaith prayer. It was There were prayers offered by members of different religious faiths without any sense of making them interfaith prayers. It's, 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 and now, the latter piece, I have no problem with. Then people are praying from the authentic forms of their traditions. Um, trying to create, I think, interfaith prayer as, uh, is just very problematic because I think it turns into just basically um, denying the, um, in, in many cases, the authentic understanding of prayer from the different religious traditions, which I don't think is common. Um, and I think we have to be very careful about that. Now that does not preclude, of course, gathering to study inter in, in interfaith settings and the like, sharing texts and, 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 and et cetera, um, for sure. And, and confronting issues honestly and challenging each other, that I would absolutely support uh, 
uh, uh, uh, that I would absolutely support 100%. Um, but to put it, I'll just give one concrete example in terms of interfaith prayer. Um, for me to participate in interfaith prayer and have someone leading a prayer saying, concluded with in the name of Jesus, um, that's not interfaith prayer for me. Um, now, it may not be that for that person concluding the prayer that way, it may be that may be so important to the way they conclude their prayer that it would not be prayer for them. And I would not have the right to tell them, well, don't pray that way. Um, if, 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 if that's how you understand um, your understanding of how, of how you should pray. Um, so I, just, I, I give that as an example. I think we have to be very careful when it comes to suggesting about inter, doing interfaith pray together as opposed to where people offer prayers out of their own tradition with no sense of uh, that we're necessarily commonly praying together. Um, I celebrate the latter. I have a lot of problems with the former. Thank you, Michael. Miriam, do we want to do another question or I think we're already five minutes after. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I want to be conscious of everyone's time. Um, I think if there's any last minute uh, or last um, kind of messages that our panelists want to share, um, we can conclude with those. I'll, I'll start off. I, I think it's time to go beyond interfaith discussion and interaction and making it, uh, I'm sorry, interfaith discussion and we need to take make action we need to be working together within our communities we've got so many problems right now and we can work together passing out ppes passing out meal kits helping other people in an interfaith setting you know groups of people groups of people from different faith traditions coming together to help other people nothing wrong with that and that's that would be just uh, i would say uh, a, a life altering, it could be a life altering experience for those who are involved with the distribution, those receiving, or just a, a general feel good feeling. There's nothing wrong with that. So, those are my two cents worth. Um, I'll agree with Janan and say 100% you're right. Thank you, Janan. Thank you, Michael. Stida? Yeah, I'd, I'd love that. Um, and I think that, you know, people of faith have such a unique position right now with the turbulence that the world is going through. Uh, and so we have to uh, be that sense of faith, you know, be hopeful, um, bring the, the, the truth to light, uh, be the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, so we, we really have to persevere right now to keep humanity moving forward and stay together. Uh, it is the word of God, um, the power of God, the spiritual solutions that's gonna get us through all of this. And so if we do uh, come together and are able to be more action oriented together and pray together, um, you know, the, then it, it'll infuse the world with an energy that is much needed. Thank you, Saida. Sharon? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we are all in this together and acknowledging, you know, how racism continues to drive systematic inequity, both in our city and across our country can really, um, can help us to develop this empathy we need to holistically recover from these challenges. So we need to not only heal ourselves, our communities, our city and safeguard uh, different faith communities that are at risk at, of discrimination, harassment and hate. Uh, based acts of violence and vandalism. Uh, but it's also important that we honor those who are directly fighting now like with, with COVID and support those who are providing essential services um, because we must show leadership in avoiding any unsafe gatherings to not put any vulnerable populations at greater risk. So it's time we just listen to each other and continue to have this inclusive dialogue to share our own experiences so they become the building blocks for solutions uh, for our community and for, for our nation. Thank you, Sharon. Any closing thoughts, John? Uh, just uh, to reaffirm, which is more or less what has been said, uh, for me, concrete implementation that creates uh, real points of uh, sharing and contact is uh, vital for uh, what we need today to try to move towards greater reconciliation. Thank you. Wonderful. And I think that will conclude our, our program today. Uh, of, 
the e part of the city of Chicago's Together We Heal initiative. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and to all of our wonderful panelists who we've learned so much from today. Thank you.